My name is Megan Bedell, and I'm one of the editors on Corwin's Equity and Professional Learning team. And it's my pleasure to introduce today's webinar presenters. We have Jamie Wellborn, Tamika Casey, and Keith Myatt. And they'll be sharing insights from their new book, Leading Change Through the Lens of Cultural Proficiency, which was also co-authored with Randall Lindsay. This book is the latest in a series of Corwin books focused on cultural proficiency that we are really honored to publish. Back in the 1990s, Corwin published the first book in the series, Cultural Proficiency, A Manual for School Leaders, written by Randy Lindsay, Kakanza Nuri Robbins, Raymond Terrell, and Dolores Lindsay. And since that first book, the tools of prof cultural proficiency have been adopted widely across North America, providing a way forward for educators committed to deconstructing systematic oppression in our schools or systemic. Uh, the book at the center of today's presentation provides vignettes and data based on work conducted across an actual school district that resulted in improvements in school climate, achievement, mindset, and equitable educational practices. Now to tell you a bit about our wonderful presenters, Jamie Wellborn, she began her career as an elementary school teacher and currently serves as an assistant professor in educational leadership at St. Louis University in Missouri. Jamie also provides consulting through her company, the Midwest Collaborative for Cultural Proficiency in Schools, where she works with school organizations to implement and sustain the work of cultural proficiency through transformative action plans. Tamika Casey currently serves as a site administrator in San Bernardino City Unified School District, and she served in many capacities in education, including a classroom teacher, a Sankofa culturally rep uh, responsive demonstration teacher, teaching coach, program specialist for the Department of Equity and Targeted Student Achievement, elementary professional and instructor in school leadership program at the College of Education at Cal State San Bernardino. She's also the founder and lead consultant of Casey Education Solutions. And Keith Mai is with us today. He served as a full-time instructor in the school leadership programs at Cal State University Dominguez Hills, we're developing school leaders dedicated to dismantling systems of oppression and focusing on cultural proficiency was at the heart of the program. And prior to that, Keith was at the Los Angeles County Office of Education and Educational Leadership Services as a director in the California School Leadership Academy. And Keith has also co-authored two additional books in Corwin's cultural proficiency series. So without further ado, I'm thrilled to turn the mic over to Jamie, Tamika, and Keith. Thank you so much, Megan. Uh, so my favorite part of tonight already, and I say tonight because I've entered into the night, um, is to look in the chat to see where everyone is from. And I noticed that we started with several states across the United States, some Canada, and I've started to see Aruba, South Korea. So um, I, I can't help but not look down there. So I'll try not to, to let it distract me too much. Um, but thank you so much for attending uh, this webinar uh, during your own time, giving up your time. We have something really exciting for you today. We want to present um, just snippets from the book. Um, as Megan said, we're, we're going to tell the story of Eveston School District. I want to start with one of my own stories in terms of how this book even um, even became a book, I would say. How did we get to this point? Um, how did we come together as the co-authors of this book? So um, I'll try to make this as succinct as possible, um, but it really, it really has come full circle for me. So in 2015, I was actually working on my PhD at St. Louis University, um, wanting to investigate response to intervention and specifically um, the school principal's role in ensuring equity with response to intervention. After a 90 page dissertation proposal was essentially rejected, uh, by my advisor, she honestly told me that she wouldn't let me uh, do this study as, as part of my doctoral work. Um, I was told to kind of go away, figure out what I was passionate about and come back and talk to her. So um, I called one of my very good friends, Dr. Terry Harris. And if you'll just remember that name for a little while um, uh, during uh, this, this webinar. So I called him who was the director of student services in the Rockwood School District. I was serving as an assistant principal during that time time and um, called him basically crying that, that I wasn't going to be able to do this study. Um, he brought me a book and it was a book written by Randy Lindsay, Keith Myatt, and Michelle Carnes. The book was Cultural Proficient Education, the one with the context of poverty. 
So I read this book quickly in one night and everything about my childhood, the schooling that I had um, um, been a part of, uh, going to be a teacher for the first time in Belleville, Illinois, moving across the river into St. Louis County, um, being an assistant principal in Rockwood. It's at that moment when I began to realize the stark disparities in educational systems that exist and the impact that had on the students uh, of our country and of our world. And so with that, to make a long story short, um, through my PhD work, I actually reached out to Keith Myatt and Randy Lindsay to see if they would validate my survey um, that investigated the degree to which principals use and value culturally proficient practices. From there, as you probably can tell, a friendship was born um, like no other. I said this a couple of weeks ago when we had our book signing at St. Louis University. Um, the co-authors of this book, we have become the deepest friends in working on this project together. So I say all of that to say, um, this is the first culture proficiency book that is research-based. For two years, um, I had the, the honor and privilege of working with uh, all of the educators in Evanston School District and really was able to investigate their implementation and application of the tools of culture proficiency. So tonight, and, and I keep saying that, I'm sorry, because it's already entered into my night. During this webinar, uh, we're going to tell you the story about Evanston, some of the tools that they used, the ways in which um, they approach this work and continue to do so today. They are actually entering into their sixth year of applying the tools of culture proficiency to open doors for their students. Um, I echo Jamie's welcome and it's so uh, it's amazing technology to be able to see people literally from you know half the planet um, being able to share in our times at this evening. Uh, whenever we begin this work, we, we, are, we honor those who actually began the work, and that's Terry Cross. Terry Cross uh, is a member of the Seneca Nation, um, and he works in, um, in healthcare, specifically um, he works as a, uh, as a counselor, and he, came, he, he became very aware that the thing that was keeping him from connecting best and serving his patients the most was he didn't understand their cultural context. He and his response to, to the differences that they presented was another barrier in terms of how well he could serve them as a, um, as a counselor. So we honor the Terry Cross who actually came up with the original tools of cultural proficiency. Uh, Jamie mentioned, uh, someone mentioned that the original book, The Manual of School Leaders uh, but with Kakanza Nuri Robbins uh, she came back from a, a, a seminar uh, that went through the cultural proficiency tools. And she said, you know, everybody wants to be anti-racist, but what are we for? And cultural proficiency provides a framework for what you are for. We are for cultural competence. We are for having a language, how we discuss our responses to difference. We are for the ability to, uh, and, and for uh, uh, expanding our knowledge of other cultures and how they view the world. So cultural proficiency is, is a very positive uh, assets-based uh, approach to how we respond to difference. And we honor these uh, original authors, especially Terry Cross, um, in coming up with these concepts. So we'll begin a little bit just with the research aspect. So uh, the purpose of the study going in was to investigate the implementation and experiences of cultural proficiency work in a suburban public school district named Eviston. So I was able to spend from January 2018 to December 2019 of really looking into the ways in which they were implementing and applying the tools of culture proficiency and some of their real learning experiences around the professional development associated with applying those tools and the outcomes. So the questions that, that really guided the work, um, I'll be honest with you, there was so much more that um, really emerged from the study than just these questions, but, and, and that was just because of my deep immersion into the school district, but this is where it began. So how do leaders describe their role in school change for culturally proficient practice? 
in what ways do the school district's implementation plans and experiences influence changes associated with culture proficient practice to serve all students? So not only what are they or how are they implementing or applying the tools of culture proficiency, but how are those that, that implementation, how is that implementation actually influencing change? And then finally, what challenges do educational leaders face during the work of culture proficiency? So I can't, um, I will, I can't promise that I can answer kind of all of the chat questions as we're going through. I'll try to address them if I see them. I noticed that um, it was asked, where is Eviston School District? Um, because of, of the interviews, because of the heavy amount of data that is in the book, um, the Institutional Review Board that, that you know, allowed me to conduct this study at my university, I can't actually disclose this. So Eviston actually is a pseudonym. Um, uh, it is a suburban, uh, again, a suburban district. It is a public school district. So um, that's the reason that, um, and it kind of explains that in the book, uh, there are some specifics around Eviston School District. So that way, you know, as you're reading, you can make uh, connections to and also be able to notice the differences um, of the district compared to your uh, district school or even your other organization. So great question, though. Thank you. Thank you for that. Go ahead, Keith. Well, awesome. So now, again, I echo what my panelists, co-panelists have all said. Welcome, everyone. And now what we want to do, we want to take a few moments just to share a little bit about how the book is comprised, how it's set up. So Leading Change Through the Lens of Cultural Proficiency is comprised of three parts. And as you see here, part one, the school leadership, educational debt, race, social class, and change. We have the framework of cultural proficiency as part two. And then part three, being committed to planning, collaboration, um, and growth and improvement. We wanted to design this book in a way that makes it easy for leaders to initiate and then sustain the personal, not only personal, but the organizational change process that you'll embark on as you go through this text, right? So this is a guidebook and it serves as a roadmap for leaders at every level as you um, yourself, as you take on this endeavor with your teams on this journey to cultural proficiency. So part one, as you see, is comprised of uh, four chapters. And as we look at these next couple slides, I'm just gonna, just pay close attention to the chapter titles because we're going to ask that you participate um, with these titles. So take a close look for the first part. Part one comprises chapters one through four. Um, and we want you to think about what resonates with you in this part, this first four chapters. And it helps us, these first four chapters helps us to set up the context for you as educational leaders. You can discover your why, both individually and organizationally. You'll then begin to plan your journey using research and the cultural proficiency framework. And so you'll look at the intersectionality of race and social class, and then um, individual and organizational change leadership. And as we look at the second part and second part of the book is where we deal with the actual framework. Part two houses the next four chapters, five through eight, where you're not only learn about the four tools that make up the framework of cultural proficiency, but you'll also learn how Eviston School District applied those tools to work, to the work of leading change. And so there you'll see the barriers, how we overcome the barriers of cultural proficiency, and then looking at our core values through the guiding principles of cultural proficiency for organizational change. Chapter seven talks about telling our stories, changing that conversation through the third tool, which is the continuum. And the ultimate is to get to a commitment of using those standards through the essential elements 
Um, and so we want you to kind of think about what resonates with you? What are you finding interesting as we go through? And then our third part brings us to the action. Of course, we can't get you this far about looking at the framework, understanding your context of where you're leading and what leverage points you have as a leader without having an ask. So in part three, the ask is that we dig in to the planning, the collaboration and growing and improving as an organization and even as an individual. So you'll have the opportunity in part three to plan your own journey by reading about lessons that were learned by Eviston and their recommendations for sustainable change. Here you see that you can implement and plan learn the recommendations, be, have sustainable commitment to this action planning, and then ensuring those equitable outcomes for all your scholars in your schools. And in, our, in every chapter of this publication, we have what we call the RDA process, the reflection, dialogue, and action process. So here is um, an example. And so we would typically do this as the leader of this work, you would be able to go into breakouts, get into small groups and have this time of reflection where you yourself would reflect upon the questions that are being asked and then have a dialogue because this work is not something that you can do in a silo on your own. So we would like for you to have time where you have discussions in your teams and groups, and then a call to action. What can you do? So we want to utilize that throughout this webinar opportunities for us to do the RDA process. And so what I'm going to ask that you do is take a look at these three areas, your reflection, something that you would discuss with teams, your dialogue and then the action. And thinking about, when you think about actions toward change in your organization, what chapter titles do you think you would like to access? And what we're gonna do is a waterfall chat. When you look at, you can look at either the reflection, the dialogue, or the action piece to, to respond to. And what I want you to do is take a moment. Now, Waterfall, this really shares whether we're all on the same page and if we're all paying close attention to the instructions. Waterfall, you're going to type in your answer in the chat and wait. And I'll give everybody a, a moment to think, a moment to type. And then on the count of three, we'll all press enter together, return together, so that we can all see the responses as a waterfall in the chat. So take one moment, think about which title resonated with you most and that you would like to explore with your team and type it in the chat and then wait. And we'll take about a minute to do so. I noticed Melissa uh, took the screenshots and actually put those in the chat too. So if you miss some of those titles, um, before you can pick up the image there in the chat, uh, just to get the language around each chapter. Perfect. And I don't want to rush it, so I'll just give you about, um, like I said, a minute to think and write. And in about 10 seconds, I will have us press enter so that we can watch all of the responses trickle down like a waterfall. Give us just a couple seconds to give everyone an opportunity to respond. Three, two, one, and enter.
Yes, I see overcoming barriers several times. The moral debt, yes. Organizational change. Lessons and recommendations. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for participating in our RDA process. And again, this process is found in every chapter of the book so that you and your teams can work through and grapple with some of the content as teams as you work towards a culturally proficient organization. And at this time, I'll turn it over and we'll talk and discuss the tools for cultural proficiency. Keith, could I address a question um, real quickly that we had early in the chat? And it was the real difference between cultural proficiency and, and cultural responsiveness. Pedagogy. That's exactly right. When you think about um, when you think about the work of equity and access, or the equity of diversity, equity, inclusion, um, it's it's really important that there to know that one that there is a difference uh, between the two. However, there are so many frameworks. What we like to consider culture proficiency is is the plate of this work. Um, culture proficiency, you'll notice that we have capitalized it. We're going to actually articulate this conceptual framework um, that that is really about, um, as we, we talk about it, that individual transformation as well as organizational change. So as you, we, we go through these slides and, and you hear us talk about Evanston School District, you'll really hear us address um, identifying barriers, acknowledging policies, practices, and individual behaviors that are on the negative, inequitable, or unhealthy side of, of culture proficiency. And then those, um, you know, opposite uh, practices, policies, procedures, and individual behaviors that are really culturally competent or culturally proficient. Um, I actually teach um, culturally responsive curriculum and instruction at the university, and we use both models, which both are valuable. Um, we talk about, again, all of the different models of this work that is really focused on removing barriers um, and opening doors for our students really has to be done in collaboration. So while we, we can um, articulate, and Zaretta Hammond does a really great job of this, while we can articulate what culturally responsive pedagogy is, what um, you know, culturally responsive teaching may be, Zaretta Hammond has said um, we can we can employ all of these strategies, um, but without adopting the mindset and the continuous journey towards culture proficiency, we may not be able to reach the desired goals that we, we truly want to reach, which means closing the disparities that we see, the gaps that we see, um, and really increasing equity and access for our students. So I don't know if the authors have anything to add. And, and we certainly, in this, this world and work of education, we, we certainly rely on each other as well. And so if you have something um, just in response to that, you know, maybe very general um, answer to the question. We ask you to put that in the chat too, because um, we view this certainly as a learning community and, and are happy to uh, learn from you as well. So um, co-authors, is there anything else you wanted to add to that? Um, I think you've done a good job of that. And I think that the best thing for someone who might have a, a query about how they fit well so well together would be then just to move into what are the tools? Absolutely, absolutely. And you'll see that within those tools, that culturally responsive pedagogy is entwined in it. It's a part, it, it's a part of it. So in this section, there's three things that I wanna get done. One is I can't assume that everybody from all the many places is aware of what the tools are or that this might actually be an introduction into cultural proficiency. So one thing I wanna make clear is the, a, a, a a snippet, a brief synopsis of what each tool is and how they work together. My other assumption must be that some of you have read one of the 19 books and uh, are here to find out more about it and, and here to see what the new thing on the block is, and so are, are interested in getting a deeper understanding of how this book adds to your value. And the third part is to show you how the book adds to the value. Um, 
the uh, what's in the book for you that is going to be of value as you engage in this work in your own environments. Um, when we were in St. Louis, I, I asked people, how many of you have used YouTube to do something, to learn how to you know, change a carburetor or learn how to do something in Microsoft Office? Um, this book is very much, I mean, while school restructuring and student improvement isn't as quick as you know, changing a hubcap, uh, the reality is this, is this is really designed for a how-to kind of a book. So it's not just a matter of, of here's a bunch of, of resources, um, which, but it's rather the story of how these resources were used to improve the climate and eventually improve student achievement. So the four tools are, number one, and you think about unpacking anything, when you think about engaging in, in any, whatever you wanna do, the first thing we have to be thoughtful about is what's already there that is gonna create a, um, a barrier for us. What are we gonna to have to be conscious and aware of as we move forward um, in terms of how we um, you know, move forward? If we, it doesn't matter what it is. If you're gonna go on vacation, the price of gas is a barrier you're gonna to have to be thoughtful about. The next one, uh, the guiding principles. What do we need to understand? What do we need to agree upon in order to do this work? The continuum provides a language for us to have these conversations. And then finally, when things are going well, what are we shooting for in terms of cultural proficiency? What are the essential elements when this thing looks like it's really getting off the ground and being done well? So these four, and I'll show you a graph at the end of this that brings this all together for you, um, in terms of barriers, guiding principles, the continuum, and the essential elements, all work hand in glove in order to get this work done. So the first one, uh, barriers, uh, we have helped, we have noticed that the, the, they come in four different areas. And um, the work that was done in Evanston is, was designed in order to bring these, these items to the fore. Systemic, what's in the system already? A sense of entitlement and privilege, in other words, the, who is the system working for the best and who is it not working for? An unawareness of the need to adapt, which is usually by the people who are, for whom the system is working well. And then just resistance to change. So when we think about systemic oppression, um, uh, one of the things that happened in Evanston, which was described in the book, is how board policies and practices at the schools was examined to determine where there might be data that would help inform where these systemic oppressions existed. So when we think about power and privilege, um, that the dominant groups are the ones that get the, the that benefit the most, abusing power over the years that, uh, would, that accrues to certain groups, Set, which then creates a sense of entitlement and privilege among those groups because the system has always worked well for them at the expense of for those for whom it does not work. And the ignorance just, people don't just, just don't know. Um, why would I need to change anything? It's working fine for us. So it's working fine for my kids. So helping to get to be smarter about and to, to create an empathy for how is a system perceived by other people? And I think nationally, we're going through a, a very, uh, a moment where the awareness of a need to adapt is becoming you know, almost normal at this point. Uh, we, we're, we're getting better and smarter about getting a, a, trying to that seeing that getting other people's perspective is an important part of it, what it means to be an American. And then finally, uh, people say, well, I love progress, but I hate change. Well, in this case, resistance to change, and there's been a lot of work done in, in leadership and other places around the, 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 the steps to change and how to bring about change. But the by focusing on the tools of cultural proficiency, a lot of really good change was brought about in Evanston and using that as the basis for the understanding about how we do this work. Now, before I move on, I want to make clear about one thing. Cultural proficiency is really good at looking at organizational practices, but 
It doesn't begin there. It begins with individual behaviors. You can't say, oh, I'm a culturally proficient individual or I work in a culturally proficient place. That is a, there's a lot of places where you are not culturally proficient and there may be some other places where you are. But everything that we think about in terms of what the organization needs to achieve needs to begin with in the, in the hearts and minds of people who are doing the work first. And that's the, in, the, in the story that is told in the book, um, there are strategies for how you bring people to an understanding of the barriers that are within their system. And the story is told very well. For some reason, my, there we go. So what do we need to agree upon to do this work? What we need to do is basically give people culture 101 about the, and get people perspectives of how other people are experiencing the place in which they work. So we have to acknowledge, number one, that we have a culture that may or may not be perceived by everybody, well, no, it will not be perceived by everyone as the same place. So what's working for some people is not working for others. And so what we have to be thoughtful, and we have data to prove it. Uh, so people are served in varying degrees by the dominant culture, which means there is also a, a group of people who are not performing it as, and, as, as well. Um, and that diversity within the groups that we perceive is much bigger and more vast than uh, we expect. We're getting better than that. Uh, over the last 20 years, our understanding of the difference in Asian cultures, in Hispanic cultures, um, in religious cultures has gotten much, much better. So to where we as a nation are recognizing that the diversity within cultures is vast and significant. Um, the, each group that we have within our schools, within our classrooms, within our cities, all of them have unique cultural needs, but here's the next part. Those needs are not a threat to our needs. We can work collaboratively. We can work together to bring those changes together so we can make the culture work for everyone. That truly is the challenge. How we, how we respond to that difference and how you can respond to the difference as, no, no, let's push the difference away. Or you can be an inclusive uh, society, inclusive culture, and bring those things in. So we recognize that some people within the same place that we work in, live in, and, and don't think of anything about, because it's exactly the same wherever we go, there are people who must change, who must adapt between the, the place where they live the place where they go to church and the place where they go to school. And that those people, systems must recognize that marginalized populations must be at least bicultural in order for them to exist in the school and to be successful in the school. So the idea that acculturation is the only means and the, the system doesn't need to uh, accommodate these people is antithetical to the work of cultural proficiency. And may, we have many, many schools, many cultures. I've worked throughout the country. Um, every place, every school wants to see every child succeed. And when you get to and work with people and they, they find out that it's their attitude and their belief system that is keeping systems, uh, certain students from, um, uh, from being successful, I have seen grown men weep in rooms full of their cohorts, of their collaborators. They, they just, it's just at a moment when they realize there needs to be a change. So the guiding principles are what we begin to agree to in order to start this work. And that's what the, is outlined in the book in terms of how Eviston went through this and in order to make this understandable by every, and agreed to by, by everyone. The language that is helpful when we think about um, uh, cultural proficiency, and I, I've taught cultural proficiency, this particular piece uh, for 30 years, and this is the thing that people remember. On the left-hand side, we have a spiral down, destructiveness, incapacity, and blindness. I'm not gonna go through the differences. Just know that places that are focused on destructiveness, incapacity, and blindness 
um, are, are um, hurtful to children's progress, are hurtful to the culture, uh, continue to have uh, benefits for some at the expense of others. And what we begin to try to look for and have discussions about is how are things working for everybody in the system? When we begin to respond or acknowledge that there is difference and that there are people who aren't doing so well, that's pre-competence. And I would have you think about pre-competence, competence and proficiency, the same way that you learned how to work uh, your cell phone. At first it was like, well, I'm making some mistakes here. This isn't going very well. Then eventually you're like, oh, this is working. I, I get it. Okay, da, 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 da. And then to the point where you're, you're just proficient, you don't think about, you do a thousand things on your phone and by just pulling it out. So the idea here is that our cultures and individuals, when it comes to responding to difference, go through a similar process of pre-competence, competence, and then finally proficiency. And proficiency is where it's just the way we do things around here. It's just part of the culture. We're always responsive to difference. And then have you ever gone to a place and canceled a meeting because there wasn't a diverse enough group? That's a very proficient, competent kind of an act. So this, of all the things people, and I think of all the things America needs right now, it's this language. And then finally, what does, I'll go back one, what does pre-competence, competence, and proficiency look like? What are we looking for in, in places and in individuals that are representing the spiraling up part of the proficiency continuum? And that's these, the essential elements. Are we as a, as a group, as a culture, as a school, as a district, are we trying to institutionalize cultural knowledge? Do we honor the many ways that people celebrate the things that everybody celebrates. What are we doing to adapt to the diversity that is apparent with, within our schools? And by the way, sometimes you just need to get people to the point to say there is diversity because they may or may not be aware of it at all. We understand that when people from differing views come together, there's going to be um, conversations, there's going to be conflict, there's gonna be arguments, there's going to be a time when we have to listen better so to understand what people are saying. So do you have rules in place for how your, your culture listens? Do you, managing the dynamics of difference requires listening and responding in a positive way to the difference that people represent. How, what, do you, what, do your, what is your school, what is your district, where does it say how we value diversity? And we're getting, again, as a country, we're getting better at that one. And then finally, how do we actually assess the culture and our progress? And I would say that the, the guiding principle and the elements in, in Evanston, these became the hallmarks for how this work was done. Jamie, would you like to add anything to the four tools here in terms of the actual work that was done in Evanston? So I think what I'm gonna do when I get to my slides, or if you wanna to move to that next slide, I may, um, I don't wanna say take over, but I have, like the whole time you've been talking, I've been thinking about several um, pieces to this framework kind of as it comes together and the ways in which Evanston really used this. So um, the tools that Keith has just described to you are here together in very, very small print, but we want to just articulate that um, this framework shows up in many of the chapters throughout the book. Um, it is based and have, has been adapted. Um, this is the, the newest version that really encompasses how these tools interact with one another. Um, it's not that uh, you and your school district or, or Evanston School District, the educators within that, used overcoming the barriers first, and then they moved to the guiding principles, and then they moved to the continuum. It's certainly not, um, these tools are not applied in a linear fashion. Um, you notice that we may have been uh, talking a lot or using metaphors that relate to travel, to journey. Um, and, and that's really the basis, I, I don't want to say the basis of the book, but the way in which we've described this journey of Evanston. Um, so 
I would like to go into each one just briefly and give you all an idea of a couple of the learning strategies and kind of paint the, the bigger picture in terms of what do these two years look like. Um, so if you'll, if you'll just allow me to go there kind of with that. Um, I know we have a reflection dialogue and action process though, and I think it would be best just listening um, to me talk about how these tools interact. We'll take time for the reflection and dialogue, and then I will give the individual strategies that the educators in Eviston used. So before we move into that RDA quickly, um, if you look, I kind of describe this as a house. So on the bottom left, as Keith mentioned, the overcoming the barriers, so the oppression, resistance to change, privilege and entitlement, and the unawareness of the need to adapt, that really informs um, a, a big piece of the data collection that Eviston was involved in. Um, one, they made sure that they had all kinds of, um, I don't wanna say mediums, but um, uh, ways of collecting this data. Now, when I say data, I don't mean the institutional data that's like the, the percentage of discipline that's occurring across racial or gender or ability uh, lines. I don't mean uh, the, the percentages in um, state testing scores. Now, while that is a, an important part of it, and while it, this was part of the process, when we say collecting data, what we mean is hearing the voices of those in the room that are doing the work. So whether it is um, the, it was the big district committee in Evanston or whether it was the individual school buildings and even down to the PLC and department level. So when you think about a high school or middle school, you have departments that were doing the work and really embedding it in, um, in that piece. But you also in, in elementary, oftentimes uh, you have PLCs at work. It's not that those don't work at middle and high as well, um, but just in terms of Ev Eviston. Um, so they really involve themselves in that data collection piece. Keith, if you would move back to the, the slide, I think, um, of the framework. All right. Oh, there we go. So you'll notice that red box there that's kind of in the middle. That is the left side of the continuum that and the data collection um, was for people to come up with unhealthy, unproductive or inequitable policies, practices, and behaviors. So we literally in that um, area that we were collecting this data with the larger district culture proficiency committee, we had thousands of post-it notes of individual data points listing specific behaviors. So those things that they as um, employees, as, as um, family members, we even had students involved in this as well, we're, we're listing the things that were culturally destructive, culturally incapacitating, those things that, that people were saying and doing to one another to make the other, meaning other than the person um, inflicting the harm, um, made, made those others to feel wrong um, and cultural blindness as well. I noticed in the chat, there was a question, uh, did you uh, look at the practices, policies, uh, and even behaviors that were working really well for those in Eviston? And the answer is yes to that. So if you go to the other side of the house, the foundation is the guiding principles. So I like to call this, and we talked about this often in Eviston. So these guiding principles actually are like the lighthouse. They shine the light for where we want to go with our practices, our policies, and our behaviors. And the place we want to go is cultural competence. Um, proficiency, you remember, is a journey. And as Keith started earlier um, in this webinar, um, he said, you know, this is a journey and we can be culturally proficient in one conversation um, with, with a person. And then the very next hour, we find ourselves in a situation and conflict arises and we actually say something that could be on the left side, maybe the unhealthy. The thing about this framework and the data collection that I've mentioned here is it's so powerful, not only to um, think deeply through leverage points and we define strategic transformative levers in the book here. Um, it's important that, and, and Eviston did this, and I know I've gone into storytelling and I know we wanna get to an RDA about these tools, but I think this is important. Um, when you get into looking at and being able to deeply reflect on um, who am I, how do I show up? They, they said, how do we show up in Eviston as educators, as parents, as staff members? Um, 
it's really important to acknowledge both of those sides because we want to see, you know, what do we consider to be culturally competent, but we also want to hear from other voices. For instance, some of the things that um, certain members of the Cultural Proficiency Committee would list as being culturally pre-competent, there would be other discussion in the room from other, from other people that would say, you know, I really see how that or I have experienced how that can actually be really culturally destructive. And so the real power of collecting this data is twofold. Um, one, it's to create those themes within the district, those leverage points. So when you get those thousand post-its that are hanging mm -hmm. on the wall that represent the data, um, that is where we can identify the leverage points that we want to focus and increase equity and access in. For example, curriculum, instruction, assessment, professional learning. For example, Eveston School District, their four emergent themes from that left side, the areas in which they felt they needed to grow to be more culturally competent in their practices and policies and behaviors were family, community engagement, and you can read about all these in the book in more detail, um, discipline, and not just discipline, like out of school suspension. It was everything from where it begins at the beginning of the year with relationships, um, with interventions that come before you even get to things such as detention, in school suspension, out of school suspension. But then once that actually takes place, I would say before that takes place, the family communication that is going with supporting students um, who may who may have those needs or not be thriving. Um, um, but also the restorative piece to that. So once they've been out for five days, how do they enter back into our school and what are we doing as the staff? Um, so looking through that professional development for administrators and a lot of theme around that was I being able to identify our own biases and how they show up. And then um, obviously, like most across the country, one of the themes or the strategic transformative levers that they began to work on in their equity action planning was around the academic piece. Where were the gaps in terms of academics as well? Um, so um, I, I, I'll, I'll stop there with that because there'll be a little bit more I wanna tell about Eveston as we get to the next slides. But I'm gonna turn it back over to Tamika. Now that you've heard just a little bit about each tool, we wanna give you some time to reflect and kind of respond through chat as well. So Tamika. Yes, again, as we get to um, we've had a lot. That's a, a meaty, a meaty portion, right? Um, being able to, for like Keith said, those of us who have already been exposed to those tools, but some of this may have been your very first time hearing um, about that. So it is, uh, it gets to be a little meaty. But before we move forward, I want us to have an opportunity to kind of unpack and 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 synthesize what we've heard and so looking at the reflection the dialogue and then the action um before you even heard about these tools think about what your understanding was around equity what your understanding was about access um in your work where you lead no matter um what area no matter what position, whether it's a site leader, whether it's a di district office or even a classroom, um, wherever your leverage point is, think about what you, um, what your thoughts are around equity um, and access, school improvement and even cultural proficiency. I saw a lot of dialogue in the, um, in the chat as we've been proceeding. Then I want you to think about what are the things that you heard that intrigued you questions that you may already have. And then we can go ahead and start putting those things in the chat, looking at some of the data, thinking about those data points and not necessarily achievement data like, like Jamie spoke of, not necessarily discipline, disproportionality data, um, but thinking about some of those data points within your organization. What inequities do you see in your organization, in your buildings? Um, what policies and practices or behavior that you can already see that might require some action, some action steps. And let's um, share some of those ideas in the chat. And again, this is something that you would do along with your team, having those discussions. Um, this is where the rubber really meets the road because you get to 
begin to put these practices in action and hearing from all of the parts of your teams, of your equity teams and your groups, um, listening to those voices. Um, one participant talked about um, getting the voices of those who are impacted, letting them who are impacted by those decisions, giving them a voice. And this is through um, this type of process, the, the reflection dialogue action process. Yes, I see some really good um, ensuring that um, all uh, school districts, the unions are all included in the um, conversation. Not just certificated union, classified unions. Good. Well, in Evanston, there was no group in the, in the, in the, within the boundaries of the city that was not invited and included. Including the community, not necessarily just those that are a part of the school system itself, but it was community members. Yeah, that the the very first committee, like when they did this kickoff event, and I think it's important that I just mention this. So um, no matter where your district or school is, perhaps you've done some work um, you know, uh, over the last several years, you've had different speakers in, we really want to honor that work. So when we go out and we're consulting, um, even in Evanston, I say this because it was important to acknowledge that many of the people showing up in the room had um, experienced uh, the work of diversity, equity, and inclusion in some way. And what I mean by that, there was some hurt um, that had been created. And it tells a little bit of that story in here around a, a specific social justice training that occurred in the, the district. Um, and it had really shut down the work of opening doors for kids before it could even start. And so um, I, I was the next one to come in, if you will. I think it's really important. And we had, uh, we that very first day, I remember, there was um, a fishbowl in which uh, people, people were allowed to express um, uh, what they, their experiences around this work in the district, what their fears were for this work. Um, and as, as you think about continuing your journey, wherever that is, I think it's important to acknowledge where you are as an organization, but also as a leader in your organization, realize that everybody's going to be at different points. One of the main things mm -hmm. was about building the capacity of the staff within the organization to not only implement this work for these two years, but to sustain it over time. In a moment, I'm gonna tell you kind of about that visioning process, um, but it was it's important um, to, to just articulate that this is, you don't go in and say, we're insinuating that you're just starting on your journey, because in fact, many people have been on this journey their entire lives. Um, and it's important that we honor and value that diversity, as I saw someone um, type in the chat before we even kind of name dropped that in one of, as one of the essential elements. Uh, it's very important in this work. So thank you for, for that. Well, I think we need to uh, move on here. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, let's head on to, uh, it says we have five minutes left. Um, so I, I, real fast, you know, there's a lot of good questions coming up here. Yes. Um, ha having a conversation about what's fair requires everyone in the system to have that conversation in the room at the same time. A room full of teachers talking about what's fair is gonna be a very different conversation than if you have students and community members um, and uh, others for, uh, having that conversation. So the book goes through how to facilitate those conversations among uh, all the groups within your district. Right, and in, in thinking about what's fair versus what's equitable, um, it might be a different conversation. <laughs> okay, so according to uh, Melissa, we're supposed to end at 4.30. So let's do the how are, we, how are the children? Yeah. I'm gonna quickly go through some of the, uh, just as a, a, a proof, here, we have a lot of resources in this book 
Um, we could spend the entire hour just talking about the structure and how things are. So I'm just going to go through some of the, the organizers that help you to bring a deeper understanding of this work uh, and that are available to you in the book. Um, and again, they're, they're much too dense and small typed to go through here, but I just, the, there are many resources uh, in here, um, graphs, charts, and the newest and latest ones for those of you who have any of the other 19 books. So uh, it, it, there's uh, a wonderful, there's a travel guide. There's this whole uh, analogy to a journey. Um, there's uh, tested school improvement strategies uh, provided for you and, and breakthrough and coaching questions. So this really is a sum of, and it refers, there are references in this book to all the other books. So, so just quickly, um, just to kind of summarize what you'll see themes throughout. So if you're thinking like, what, what should I take away from this webinar? What am I thinking in terms of starting or, or continuing this work using the cultural proficiency framework? Think about, uh, or this is, what, this is what they found out regarding implementation um, in Evanston. So one, the recommendation is to develop a common language around culture proficiency. The framework allows you to do that. Engaging in the learning strategies that Eviston used that are, that are clearly articulated. Everything from uh, the materials you'll need to the amount of time it'll take you to do that. Um, that all helps to develop that common language. Um, one, uh, Eviston, the superintendent from the very first day, wanted to ensure that he and the group was going to embed this work in all aspects of the school district. So when you think about impacting um, the district level, the building level, the, the department um, grade level, um, level, um, as well as the individual student level, so in each classroom, that's not something you can check the box on. Um, Glenn Singleton said, talks about random acts of equity. Using the culture proficiency framework allows you to move away from those random acts. While those are important, in order to see the change and sustain this work over time, you have to have that visionary leader who sees it through and knows what's gonna happen if you have a change in staff or administration. So you'll see their professional learning was a key theme throughout. Um, dedicating the time and resources necessary for that professional learning. Um, starting, sorry, and I know that, that time is of essence here, but starting with your strategic plan, um, that's something in Eviston, they wanted this directly connected to their comprehensive school improvement plan and their individual building plans. The mission and core values are essential in this work. The core values allowed them to really answer the question, are we doing what we say we are doing? And uh, the data shows uh, that, or the data show, excuse me, that um, that is not always the case. Sometimes there are contradictions to, to that work. So, um, and again, the whole notion is make sure that the voices are at the table. So building that community, engaging families and community partners to do this work, um, even uh, down to the student level. Uh, we can learn a lot from our students. So Tamika, I'll hand that over to you as we're talking about the children. Earlier, Jamie referenced Terry Harris, um, Dr. Harris, and she asked you to remember his name. And she, he wrote the foreword of this book. And in his writing, he talks about the Maasai people and their greetings to one another. And he talked about how when they greeted one another, they would ask, not how are you, not how's it going, but and how are the children? In reference to the fact that if the children are thriving, if the children are doing well, then we're all doing well. Remember the bottom line is are our scholars do they have the access? Do they have equity? Do they have everything, the resources that they need to be successful in this world? And are we providing that for them? And so, and how are the children? And so he writes in the forward, one of the most courageous acts as a parent is to leave your child with someone else, to love them, to see them, to hear them as you would, to truly care for them, Parents do this every day. 
trusting that we will keep their kids whole. So as you reflect for a moment on Dr. Harris's quote and on what we the authors believe to be the reason we do this work and what you've heard in this webinar so far, if you are a parent or if you have ever had the privilege of being a guardian of a child, this reasoning may resonate with you as well. And when you have children and you raise them until they are five years old and you find out what love really is when you do this, you take them to a building and you drop them off. And you say to those people who are greeting you at the door, please take them and treat them with the respect they deserve. Please make them smart, take care of them, keep them safe, and give them the basis for what they need to become successful adults. Our families, they give us their children, their greatest responsibility for 12 to 13 years. And we use terms like leader, educators, teachers in this book, right? And teaching is not a profession, it is a calling. And there is no parent who would not give up their lives for their children, for their child, for their children, and they are trusting us, each and every one of us to keep them safe. So when we think of using the vehicle of cultural proficiency and this framework to reach that moral imperative of education, it is to ensure equity, access and inclusion for each and every child that we are entrusted with, regardless of their race and ethnicity, their national origin, their language, gender, sexual orientation, regardless of their faith, social class, or ableness. What we do and say matters. There is no higher calling. That is why we need to do this work well for our children. For whom will you do the work? What are you willing to do to ensure equity for all? And how are the children? We thank you for this time. We thank you for allowing us this space to be with you and to go with us on this journey to cultural proficiency. We look forward to um, communicating and, and seeing you again. Thank you so much again for your time. Thank you so much, Keith and Tamika and Jamie for this um, wonderful presentation. And thank you everyone who joined us and thanks for sticking around so we didn't have to cut it too short. Um, have a wonderful evening or afternoon or morning, depending on which part of the world <laughs> you're right. joining. And where you are in the world. <laughs> thank bye -bye. you all. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you all. Thank you.